water molecules really like other water molecules because of the fact that they have those partial positive, partial negative parts. They like hanging out with one another, forming those hydrogen bonds, and they like being able to move all around. All this is possible in bulk water. So water's freely moving around. No matter where it turns, there's something that it can bind to. There's an oxygen for every hydrogen, a hydrogen for every oxygen, and it's happy. But now, say you are to stick something nonpolar in there. You can stick something non-hydrophilic in there, and that would be happy. Water would hang out with it. Something else that's partially charged or fully charged, water is going to let it in just fine and move around all fine. But if you stick something nonpolar, well, water can't form very favorable interactions with it. Not nearly as favorable as the interactions it could form with other water molecules. So the water is going to maximize its water-water interactions, minimize its interactions with that nonpolar thing. It excludes the nonpolar thing from its network, but, and in this way, the kind of water gets trapped. It gets trapped in this sort of shell around this nonpolar thing. Because if it were to turn, it would break off its interactions with its partners, and all it would see is the nonpolar thing, which is not fun for it. So although all this other water is hanging out and having fun, this water's tied up. The situation gets even worse if you have multiple things. However, there's a solution, at least a partial solution. Think about having two nonpolar things in water. And so just to simplify things, I put them aside so you can see what, what's going on a little better. We can see that we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, and one, two, three, four, five, six. So we've got six water molecules around each of these things. We're tying up 12 water molecules, taking them out of the free water. But what we can do is if we squish these together, now by squishing the nonpolar things together, well now it turns out that we freed up four waters. So we only need eight to cut to surround both of them as opposed to six for each of them. So this water's freed up. And when we talk about molecules like being free, we talk about entropy. So we get an entropic gain from that. And so you can think about the nonpolar things as kind of being excluded by the water as the water tries to maximize its water-water interactions with one another. And this draws the nonpolar things together. Now, once the nonpolar things are together, you know, now you can get those like Van der Waals interactions, those London dispersion forces, those, the fact that the electrons kind of randomly are moving around and they randomly happen to be over here more than over there, and then that kind of gets them all in sync. They are then able to kind of have this attraction for one another, but that attraction for one another is not going to be the driving force. The driving force is going to be this entropy of the water and then they're coming together, and now you have the chance for those interactions. Speaking of those interactions, if you have, say this wasn't all nonpolar, say there was some part that could actually form like a salt bridge. In this nonpolar environment, that's gonna be higher strength. That's gonna have a higher strength. The strength is gonna be stronger for things like a salt bridge. In the nonpolar environment, going back to Coulomb's law and your dielectric constant and stuff, Basically, there's less to distract it. Those charges can feel one another better, and so that's going to be stronger than for out here, where there's all this other competing stuff. It's a little weird when thinking about blobs, but we can also, all of this applies in the context of, say, a pharmaceutical compound binding to a protein target. There's often going to be a site, so maybe it's an active site, maybe it's just like a little shallow pocket or something, but there's going to be some nonpolar part that's kind of solvent exposed. And in that solvent exposed portion, so that's going to basically, the water is going to be tied up around it. So the water can be moving freely all around this, all around this outside of the protein, all around the hydrophilic parts, but it's going to be tied up around those hydrophobic parts. Similarly, if we have a kind of compound that has hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts, all around the hydrophilic part, you're going to get that free water and it's going to be happy because the water, if it turns, it likes the hydrophilic thing, so it's going to interact with it. And if it turns and there's water and it'll interact with that, so it's happy. However, what's going to happen if you have a hydrophobic part? The hydrophobic part is going to be surrounded by the water. And that's going to be like the tied up water. If, however, you kind of put the drug in the pocket and it matches nicely, well now, look at all that water you just freed up. You just freed up a lot of water. You just got a big entropy gain. And now if you have like specially made interactions or kind of like 
interactions now in this kind of like hydrophobic zone are going to be stronger. That's going to give you some enthalpy gain. But the big factor is going to be this release of the water, the freeing of the water, the gain in the entropy. So there can be like different combinations of entropy and enthalpy that contribute to things involving the hydrophobic effect. But the key thing about the hydrophobic effect is that you're freeing up the water. That's going to make the water happy. When you make things happy, that's going to be thermodynamically favorable. And so the binding would be thermodynamically favorable. And you can optimize those binding interactions to try to get a compound that is either like stronger or more selective.